Well, good morning. good morning. Good to have you guys here today, and that was actually a pretty nice greeting. Thanks for greeting me back. That was not bad. There's sometimes you say good morning to people, and they're like, good morning. And that's when people like myself, my son has actually done this too before, I say good morning, you know, and then, so thankful that you guys are here today and thankful for this opportunity. Uh, if you would, please take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter number 1. Now, also, if you would, please hold your place there. And I would like for you to also turn to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to come back to Colossians. But I want us to go over to Hebrews first. Thank you so much for your prayers. I hope that you will continue to pray for me uh, as uh, we just got back from uh, Paris Island. My son over there uh, is now a Marine, and uh, he graduated this past Thursday, and so we're happy to have him back home with us, but uh, I think we brought uh, just some kind of a little bit of a congestion bug or whatever that we're trying to get over, and so I'm needing a little bit more strength from my uh, voice this morning, so Lord and I have already talked about it this morning, so... Uh, you, you pray for us this morning, and I've got a, I got to preach tonight at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. Uh, I have an opportunity to uh, do the revival services there uh, all the way through uh, Wednesday. And so uh, I'm definitely going to need a special uh, boost in my voice uh, by the time that uh, takes place. <clears throat> so Colossians chapter number one, like I said, we're going to be there in just a moment. But uh, if you've taken your Bibles and you're there in Hebrews chapter 11, I want to begin reading in verse number one. I want to give you a little bit of a sermonette, if you will. And that's what of a, somewhat of a prelude to what we're going to talk about today. And uh, if you're taking notes <clears throat> this morning, I want to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to talk about how Christ himself is the source of our faith. And literally, this is a series of messages that I preached two years ago on He is, on He is. And basically that comes from the mindset of the fact that Christ Himself referred to Himself as the I Am. So if you're looking there in Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now I don't know if you're familiar with possibly underlining in your Bible. It's a good practice to have because this is one of those verses of Scripture that you want to be able to remember and recall, especially when you've got uh, neighbors, friends, co-workers who uh, say that they just don't believe in God. You say that there is no evidence for God. Well, the Bible makes it very clear that there is evidence. In fact, he says again, I'll just read it. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And what are the things that we hope for? We obviously hope for an eternal life. We just talked about or sung about that in our songs here this morning. But he says it's not only assurance hoped for, but the conviction. If you've got a King James Bible, it says evidence, I believe, of things not seen. You say, well, Jonathan, help me understand, because I do believe in God, but when I do talk to those people who are, who are atheists who say they don't believe in God, what is the evidence? Well, this building right here is a good example of knowing that someone designed this building. Now, I may ask this question, you may know who actually designed it or who actually built it, but for the most part, there are buildings all around us that have been designed and built, and we don't even know who the builder is. But that builder does exist. Take that same mindset and you look at the trees. You look at all of creation. You look at the stars and the planets and all of the things that God Himself has created throughout the universe. That in itself is the evidence of God's existence. Regardless of what most scientists, most school teachers, and people out there who want to claim that this whole place came in uh, by a big bang... Like one person said a long time ago, God says in the, the Bible says in the beginning, God and bang, it was there. So uh, ultimately, we understand that God created everything. Now, the thing is, that revelation, folks, is not enough to save someone, but it is enough to condemn them. And you can go to Romans chapter one and see that very fact. But it's important to understand, even the book of writer of Hebrews here says that uh, the, there is evidence is assurance 
And he goes on to say, verse 2, for by it, by what? By faith. Faith, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, by it, men of old gained approval. And then he goes on down the line, he says in verse number 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen has not been made of things which are visible. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered a, uh, to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he, is, uh, he was a righteous man. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up for he obtained the witness that before his death or before his being taken up he was pleasing to God. Now, I want you to wrap your mind real quickly around verse number 6 cuz this is going to give us the thrust that we need as we go back to Colossians chapter uh, number 1. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says, and without faith it is impossible to please God. Now, do we have to explain what the word impossible implies? <laughs> I want to fly off the building. It's impossible. Why? Law of gravity. It's going to keep me from that. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Same thing when it comes to faith. How am I going to please God? You see, this is important, folks, because at the very moment, we want to be pleasing to God. As wonderful as the singing of the hymns this morning and the praise song and singing of that wonderful uh, special right before the message, you come today and you give your tithes and your offerings and you think in your mind that you are pleasing God by being here as if it's doing Him a favor. You would be wrong. You see, faith is one of those things where knowing the God that we serve, the God that we come to worship and we come to be together with, and when God says for us to move, to accomplish, which He uses your pastor to help give a vision and, and goals and desires of what God wants to do in this church, within this community, for the church to fail at trusting God in moving forward, guess what? You no longer please God. Are you listening to me this morning? Because this is exactly where churches fail today. I understand that COVID really hit us hard. And there's a lot of people who are either afraid or at least a, people, a lot of people who have gotten comfortable being home and not coming back and worshiping God. But the Bible tells us very clearly that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. COVID does not change that. Our feelings and our emotions don't change that. We are called to be obedient to God's Word. And we as a congregation are to encourage other people, those who claim to be believers in Christ. We still want to say... Look, but let's be obedient. I'll help you do whatever it takes. I heard uh, one, uh, our, our sister here this morning said that she was wanting to come to church and hear me preach, but uh, her car wouldn't start. And somebody came and picked her up this morning. That's being a part of the family of God. That's being obedient to the Word of God. And that's what we've got to be. So we notice in this text here, verses 1 through 6, that first and foremost... He is worthy of our faith. He is worthy of our faith. Again, now by the time we get down to verse number 6, we're seeing why He's worthy of our faith and what that produces for us. But history itself reveals God's reality. The testimony of eyewitnesses. For example, Moses, did he not write the first five books of the Bible? And he himself witnessing God's mighty hand as they split the waters of the Red Sea, as he saw the, the hand of God uh, giving plagues, those ten plagues to, is, uh, to Egypt, and saving a people. And so we understand that there are men who have written things down because they have literally been eyewitnesses. But let's go beyond the Old Testament. What about those disciples? 
right? Luke himself, if you look at the very beginning of Luke, he will say, I took a very careful, very calculated testimony of those who were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. So see, nature tells us that God exists. Jesus Christ comes to show and prove, once again, that God exists. And Luke even tells us about that. John's epistles, he himself, and say in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, they experienced Christ in front of them. For example, they experienced Him through their senses. That which we have heard. That which we have seen, which we have looked upon, what our hands have touched. That's no figment of your imagination, folks. That's reality. And by the way, a lot of times we as Christians, I think we're satisfied with just because we've grown up with this idea of thing called faith. That faith is supposed to be blind. No, it's not. What do we just read in Hebrews? Faith is is assurance it is a conviction again other translations i think help bring out the fact that it is evidence and i'm telling you folks there is more evidence to be an atheist than there is to be a christian today so not only moses not only the gospels john's epistles here and and those disciples but paul himself acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 9 what happened to paul he got knocked off of his animal didn't he He was quickly and abruptly introduced to God. And he went on to testify about it in chapter 22 as well as chapter 26. His Damascus Road experience. So, we understand that God is worthy of our faith. But let me just say this as we go into our our message here this morning. God is also the source of our faith. He's the source of our faith. If you think for one moment you became a Christian by your own accord and your own abilities, you again would be far mistaken. If you're here today and you claim to be a Christian because maybe mama was a Christian or grandpa was a Christian or someone else in your family, let me tell you something. You yourself have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Salvation does not come by association. It comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we each will one day stand before God and give an account for our lives. Again, verse number six, without faith, it is impossible to please him. And here's the crux of the message here. Look what he says here. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Notice it doesn't say he is something. No, he is. You ever wonder why it just says he is? Because we believe that He is because He is the I Am. We believe that He is because He is the I Am. So he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. And again, the King James would say the who diligently seek Him. So let's go over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. So let's talk about this I am. He is. And if you are able, if you would please stand together as we read verses 13 through 20. For He rescued us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things. And in Him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. And He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And He Himself will come 
uh, to have first place in everything, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross, through Him. I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for Your Word. Speak now to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness that You've already shown me and giving me strength in my voice. Continue, Lord. In accordance with your will, may you be glorified and praised here today. Speak to our hearts. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So this one, the I am, who is the all in all. If you're taking notes, number one, he is Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. You see, folks, if you ever ask the question, how can I know for sure that God exists? The answer is Jesus Christ. Remember, that's the, that's, the, that's the famous Sunday school answer for all children. Hey, kids, what did you learn in Sunday school today? We learned about Jesus. And, and, and in one sense, He is the answer, isn't He? He is absolutely everything. It all points back to Him. But when it comes to God, He is the image, the expressed image of the invisible God. Notice what He goes on to say here, back in verse number 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. Firstborn of creation. In your notes there, if you're taking it, write down Hebrews 1, verse 3. Hebrews 1, verse 3. And you go back and you'll see that the writer of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, shows that Jesus Christ is the radiance. The radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature. That's Jesus Christ. The word image here in the Greek literally is the word icon. It's where we get the idea of an image. For example, if you've got a penny or a dime or something on your, uh, some sort of change in your pocket, you look and you'll see there's an image stamped, right? Okay. Last I looked, Penny still had Abraham Lincoln. And some of you guys are, 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 are probably similar to my wife. And we, you know, whenever we get ready to pay for something, it's, it's, it's like Abraham squeezes and eeks a little bit. Because why? We're trying to pinch pennies. Right? But that's what we're talking about. If, if, if you remember when Jesus was talked about, uh, he talked about, who, should we give taxes to Caesar? You remember what Jesus said? Whose image is on the coin? Right? But do you remember what he said? Render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But then he says, render to God what belongs to God. What do you think he was saying there? Just like that coin has Caesar's image on it, you give back to him what he requires of you. But you, made in the image of God, give yourself to God. Render to what Caesar, what belongs to Caesar. But you render to God what belongs to God. Can I get an amen on this, folks? You belong to God. You are not your own, as the Scripture says. You've been bought with a price. So therefore glorify your Father which is in heaven. So this image here, He is the image of the invisible God. God's image is sacred. And by the way, I don't know where you fall on this, but I made a decision a long time ago to never put up pictures or renderings of what has been known about Jesus or what some people, artists, believe about Jesus. Most anything that if I have, whether it's in my office or in my uh, uh, home or whatnot, if it's a picture of a Jesus, it's usually the backside. It's, It's understood. Why? Because God does not want us to have in our mind what we think He looks like. You go back to the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, he makes it very clear. Do not make any graven images. And don't even uh, uh, imagine what I look like. God's very careful about this. In fact, write this down. Genesis chapter 35, verse 2. Genesis chapter 35, verse 2. Jacob tells his household... He says, I want you to get rid of all of the gods, the foreign gods which are among you, and purify yourself and change your garments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 says, You shall not make for yourself an idol 
or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water on the earth. He does not want us to say this is what Jesus looks like. Now that might cause you to think, well, what about these people who play Jesus in various plays? Well, I can only tell you what many of the uh, reformers and those who uh, are forefathers in the faith said that, that anyone who is depicting a play, that's one thing. You can't necessarily take them home with you. You're not hanging them on a wall. You're not creating a little, uh, a, a little altar with their picture on it. You're just enjoying how Christ and, 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 the, and the gospel is being played out in, in front of you. Hold your place there. And I want you to turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. This is the Gospel of John. And listen to what the Scripture says. John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. The Bible tells us that the Word, that is Christ Himself, verses 1 through 5 tells us about the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. But He says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about Him and cried out, saying, This is He of whom I said, He who comes after me is higher in rank than I, for He existed before me. For of His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth was realized through Jesus Christ. Now listen to what John goes on to say. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. I think it's important that we ought to be just content with the fact that God wants His representation known through His Son, Jesus Christ. Through His Son, Jesus Christ. Write this down, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It says, and He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation or the impression, stamp. In other words, Jesus Christ helps us to see what God looks like. In other words, of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. And when He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You see, here's something we need to understand, folks. It is in our sinful nature, our flesh, to put God on display Because it kind of makes us feel good. It makes us feel significant. We derive some benefit from trying to have a picture, if you will. And we need to be careful of that. Write this down. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 to 23. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 to 23. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But listen to what they did. They became futile in their speculations. And their foolish heart was dark, and professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and of crawling creatures. Jesus is that express image, not anything that's in our imagination. And you can write down 1 Corinthians chapters 1, verses 18 through 25. You say, but Jonathan, doesn't, this, doesn't it at least help us to have some kind of an idea? Do you remember the children of Israel when Moses was up on the mountain to receive the tablets, the, the Ten Commandments? What was their first intention? He's been up there way too long. We don't even know what's happened to this Moses who, you know, so Aaron, why don't you, and apparently Aaron might have been some kind of an engraver, someone who uh, did that back in Egypt. Why don't you make this for us a golden calf? And we will say that this is what brought us out of Egypt. Are you seeing the significance here? If we feel like we need to somehow have God in our possession. God is the one who stands outside of our four walls. God is the one who is totally and completely other. We revere Him and worship Him the way He wants to be worshipped. Not 
what feels good to us. And the people there in Romans chapter 1, in their wisdom, designed uh, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for images in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. You see, it's different from the way we think, isn't it? But we've got to accept the fact that God's wisdom is greater than man's wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25 makes that very clear. And then you go on into chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. You see, God's wisdom is foolishness to all who think according to the flesh. What does the Scripture say? The message of God is foolishness. The choice of God is foolishness. And those who are of natural persuasion cannot accept what is eternally significant. Why? Because God's ways are not our ways. Write this down. Isaiah chapter 44, chapter 45, and chapter 46. All through that little section of Isaiah, God is making it very clear who He is and who He expects for us to understand. He says in chapter 46, verses 9 through 10, He says, Remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. You see, I think very clearly one of the reasons why God does not want that representation to be replaced or substituted, if you will, is because He knew from the Old Testament time there would be only one who would bear His image, and that's Jesus Christ. And He is the only one that we look to. So there is no God besides our God, and Jesus is the express image and representation of Him. Number two, He is the firstborn of all creation. You're back in Colossians, look again at verse number 15. He says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, how many of you know of a Jehovah's Witness? Somebody uh, that maybe lives nearby you, or you've been visited by the Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? So some of us have at least, if nothing, we probably drive by uh, the Kingdom Halls every once in a while. When I first moved here uh, back about nine years ago, uh, we had that fateful knock that came to our door, and sweet little old ladies that were just wanting to pass out little pamphlets and said, if you'd like, we'd love to have a Bible study with you. And I don't think they were expecting what came out of my mouth next. So we'd love to have a Bible study with you too. When can you start? And then they, so they said, well, okay, we'll come back and uh, we'll start going. And, and for weeks, they came and sat in our living room and we just discussed. And I got a chance to literally see a little bit more about uh, what they believe. And really what it came down to where we had to part ways was this verse right here. Right here in this text. They would say, you see, the Bible says that He is the firstborn. We understand that to be that He is God's first creation. Now, how many of you understood that they believe that Jesus Christ is actually Michael the archangel? See, they won't, they won't tell you that up front. And they believe that Michael the archangel was God's first and greatest creation. And God used Michael to create all other things. But that's not at all what the Scripture says. When it says here that He is the firstborn of all creation, the Greek word there is prototokos. Prototokos. Literally, the word means prominent or foremost. Sometimes it means it's the firstborn in a family, but it is not only limited to that. Let's take Israel, for example. Israel was known to be prototokos, firstborn. Well, let me ask you, was Israel the first civilization that was ever created? No, they weren't. Was, uh, was Israel the largest civilization ever created? No, they weren't. So he's not the largest, not the first. Literally, what he is saying about Israel is that Israel is the apple of God's eye, the object of God's affection and blessing. Before all other nations, Israel was important to God. And all nations would be blessed through 
Israel. So literally the word prototokos or that firstborn means unique, ranking member of a group. Romans 8.29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he, that is Christ, would be a firstborn among many brethren. Firstborn in Christ's case does not mean that he was created first, but that he is over all creation. And you see that in verses 16 and 17. But all things were created by him, verse 16. Again in verse 16, all things were created for him. Then in verse 17, he existed before all things. And again in verse 17, he holds all things together. And so Paul here is literally asserting that there is something very special about Jesus Christ. Firstborn of all creation. So number one, we saw that He is the image of the invisible God. Number two, He is the firstborn of all creation. Number three, He's the head of the body, the church. He's the head of the body, the church. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I was always told that my dad was the head of the household. But my mom was quick to say, but I'm the neck that turns the head. Oh, come on, y'all, that was funny. (laughs) Y'all can laugh. You can say amen. You're not going to hurt my feelings. But no, the truth of the matter is, Jesus Christ is the head. Now, of course, I understood what that meant. What Daddy says, Daddy means. And Daddy's word is final. So we understand that. We got that, right? So when the scripture says that Jesus Christ is head, what does that mean? His word's final. There's no questioning. Well, let's just kind of get back to what we talked a little bit about earlier. About all these people who've chosen to maybe stay home because of COVID and all that kind of stuff. You have every right and every reason by the authority of God's word to tell them they are living in sin. Now, you may not want to start that way because they might slam the door in your face or kick you out of their house. But if with a burden and a broken heart, they are living in disobedience. Because Jesus said that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And we encourage them. The Bible even says there in Hebrews, tells us to provoke one another to good works. He's the head, the body of the church. Write this down, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 13. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 13. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, or whether all are made to drink into one Spirit, or of one Spirit. Write this down, Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. Write this down, John 15, I'm sorry, John 5, verses 17 through 19. John 5, 17 through 19. But he answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing for whatever the father does. These things, the son also does. Do you see Jesus Christ himself operated under authority? He being God, but the God man here on this earth, he literally operated under the authority of what was decided in heaven. He never deviated. And He is our perfect example. So He is the head, the body, the, of the body of the church. Number four, He's the beginning. He's the beginning. Look there in verse 18. It says, He also is the head of the body of the church, and He is the beginning. Now here's an area where if you learn a little bit about what the, the book, uh, the Muslims, uh, Quran, the book of uh, Quran even the Muslims begin to understand, and, and here's what's interesting, they believe in Isa, Jesus. Though they may think that 
some of the words of the Bible is corrupt, they believe and understand that the first and the last and the beginning and the end is God. And when you tell them, do you know that Isa or Jesus, they'll tell you, they'll say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Listen to what he says. I am the first. I am the last. I'm the beginning and the end. Alpha and what? Good, you guys are still out there. All right. So Jesus Christ being God of very God. He is the beginning. Why? Because as John said in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. So He is the beginning. And so we couple what He says here in Colossians 1.18 with what He says in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 3, as well as verse 14 where He says, and, uh, and, and the Word became flesh. This speaks clearly of Christ's deity. Number five. Number five, he is the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn from the dead. Look again at verse 18. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. So in keeping what we've learned, there even in verse 15, he's not the first who had been raised from the dead, right? He's not the first to have been raised from the dead. There were several people who had been raised to the dead. But guess what happened? They died again. Lazarus, in Christ's own ministry, said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth. But good old Lazarus, he actually had to die again. You know what's interesting? Archaeology, you can look this up. Archaeology actually tells us they know where Lazarus was first raised from the dead. But do you know he also has another place where his final resting place is? That is so cool. I love archaeology. It just, it's, it's, a, it's, it's basically really what, what Jesus himself said. Remember when the, uh, when the Pharisees came up to him and said, uh, when, when he was coming into the city on the back of a, 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 a cult, and those Pharisees says, you need to tell your disciples to stop saying what they're saying. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you remember what Jesus said? If I tell them to stop, the rocks will cry out. Folks, and we'll tell you right now, the rocks are crying out more than ever. Archaeology is revealing what we already believe and know about Christ and what the Word of God has said. So He is the firstborn from the dead. So He is not the first to have been raised from the dead. He is the first to rise and yet still lives. And guess what, folks? Because He lives. You could probably sing that song, right? I can face tomorrow. His resurrection gives us so much hope. The resurrection boosts our faith. Because He lives, we want to even pursue Him more. And by the way, I will say this. If the fact of His resurrection does not get you excited, then there may not be something, well, there may be something that's missing in your life. Because my Bible, and if I were to open your Bible to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I think your Bible would also say, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Is there anybody in here today who doesn't want to be held accountable for all the things in the past? Am I the only one? Just a few of us, right? I, I, I'm so thankful that because of what Christ did on the cross, that all my sins are under the blood. That's a good place for an amen right there. Well, you'll get, maybe about, I'm getting too close to 12 o'clock, aren't I? All right, so, <laughs> so he's the first born from the dead. John, 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. Beloved, now are we children of God, and it has not yet appeared to us to what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. 
You see, this is Jesus' prayer in John 17, verse 24. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. And just listen very carefully, folks. I could easily sit here and try to get us all excited about the fact that you see things that are happening in Israel. You guys are keeping up with news. Does that somewhat get you a little bit excited? The possibility that maybe, just maybe, the Lord's return is coming soon? Let me ask you this. What are you doing to be obedient in light of that truth? Because Jesus Himself said, I'm going away. But what did He leave behind for us to do? To occupy. And by occupy does not mean fill space. To serve Him faithfully until He returns. That's what really should be at the forefront of our hearts, especially in light of his resurrection. Number six, number six, he is the head over all rule and authority. He is the head over all rule and authority. If you just write this down uh, over in in, in chapter two, Colossians verses nine and 10, listen to what he says here. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form and in him you have been made complete and he is the head over all rule and authority so again this speaks to his deity he is the fullness of deity dwelling in bodily form all in him are made complete this also speaks to christ's authority he is over all guess what that means he's over you and he's over me in short my friends listen very carefully he alone is worthy he alone is worthy why because he is the king of kings the lord of lords and at the very name of jesus christ at his very name all knees will bow and every tongue will confess that jesus christ is lord now i'm going to say something everybody look real quick We have the absolutely undaunting privilege as believers to confess Jesus Christ right now. And that's what every believer will do. And see, we have the privilege to not only bless His name, to promote His name, to confess His name and His glory right now and in eternity and in eternity but if you're here today and christ has not saved you you are still in your sins you will one day confess jesus christ as lord but you will not do it for all eternity let me give you an idea of exactly what that means what paul is thinking of when he's actually saying there were times when rebellious slaves or insurgents within the empire would come in and they would be caught because of their crimes. And they would much rather shake their fist at the king than to give him the praise that he is due. And here's what would happen, is before they were killed or before they were executed, they were forced onto their knees. And they had to admit that the king is the ruler of the kingdom. There's a whole bunch of people out there today who do not believe in Christ Jesus. Christopher Hitchens was one of those atheists who was cursing God to the best of his ability, even though he had cancer in the throat and lost every ability to speak. But I can tell you right now, one day Christopher Hitchens will bow before God and will give utterance to the fact that he is king of kings. But he will suffer for all eternity. You and I have the privilege of doing it here and then. So if you're here today, and I don't mean to necessarily do it from the standpoint of of scaring you, because the goodness of God is what leads us to salvation. It is the very simple fact that God himself sent his son to this earth to die on the cross 
for you and I. When he died on the cross is what we call the great exchange. Jesus himself took all of our sin and placed upon himself. And by virtue of his, of his sacrifice, those of us who place our trust completely in him receive his righteousness. Man, that's an amazing exchange. And if you've never done that today, oh, you are missing out on such a blessing. And I don't want to see you miss out on eternity. And if you're not saved here today, I'm happy to be here for as long. We're going to play a, a, a hymn of invitation here in just a moment. But you can be saved today. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, as we confess in our hearts and we know that you are the great I am. And by virtue of that truth, we understand that He is Christ, the Son of the living God. God, a very God Himself, who died on the cross for our sins. Lord, help us today. Lord, may that make such a resounding uh, purpose statement in our hearts that, Lord, we will serve our risen King because He is. So God, I pray that regardless of what, uh, how this message may have hit and fallen upon the ears and hit the hearts of people here today, God, I pray that you will receive glory out of what is done here today. As we come to this time of invitation, Lord, deal with hearts. And if there's someone here who does not know you as Savior, Lord, may they not leave this place without knowing full well and having that assurance. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.